Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Mailbag, the all-mailbag show here on Collider Video, where all we do is take your questions. My name is John Campia. I am the uh, senior producer over here at Collider Video, and I'm so glad you decided to join us on this Sunday. Um, now, for those of you who don't know, never seen Mailbag before, this is very casual. It's very laid back. It's us just talking movies, a little bit of behind the scenes here at Collider Video, and it's just us gabbing and talking about movies. Nothing more important to that. And hey, listen, if you want one of your questions or one of your important topics brought up on Mailbag, or maybe during our Mailbag segment on Movie Talk Monday through Friday, you can just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Just send on your question. Understand that we get like a thousand questions a week, so we cannot take all of them, but we get to as many as we possibly can. And listen, um, one of the things, this isn't one of the official questions of the day, but for the past, you know, uh, almost 24 hours, I have been getting tons of emails Tons of tweets, tons of Facebook messages, whatever, of people asking me to talk about what we saw at D23 yesterday. Yesterday, me, Christian and Mark, we were all down in Anaheim, California, watch at the annual, well, it's not annual, is it? But at the Disney Expo D23. And yesterday was, in the morning, their big panel on all their live action stuff. So the night before, they did a big panel on all of Pixar and Disney animation stuff, so all the animated stuff that was coming. Yesterday, they did a stuff on all the live action action stuff coming from Disney. That includes Disney Live Action Studios. That includes Lucasfilm. That includes Marvel. So um, I'll kind of take the hundreds of questions that you guys have all came, sent to me and just kind of compact it into one. What did I think about what we saw at D23 yesterday? Well, let's start with Star Wars. Now, Star Wars was the last thing that they talked about at D23 yesterday. And I have to tell you, I was underwhelmed and disappointed. Now, don't get me wrong. What I heard was good, but that's all we did. We heard stuff. Uh, we saw a little message from the director of Rogue One on set saying, hey, we're recording something. See you later. They announced the full cast, which is great, but I could have got that on Twitter. I mean, two, 10 seconds after it happened. Um, seeing Alan Tudyk is in it is awesome. I loved him as Wash. I love him in everything I see him in. Um, and, you know, the cast line was cool. They showed us a cast picture. That's cool. But once again, it popped up online five seconds later. I didn't have to be a D23 for that. And, you know, it was cool. J.J. Abrams came out on stage, didn't say anything he hasn't said before. They brought uh, Oscar Isaac... Um, uh, John Boyega, and I, I'm forgetting the, um, the, the the female leads, uh, Daisy Ridley, uh, is that her name? Anyway, uh, they brought them out on stage, and that was, that was cool to see, but once again, they didn't really say much. They were just kind of there to wave and say hi to everybody. Um, the big pop was when they kind of took everybody's surprise and brought Harrison Ford out on stage, and that was great. But that was it. I mean... J.J. Abrams said the other day that they weren't going to show any new trailers, new footage from The Force Awakens. And I understood that. I got it. And yeah, but I thought they would do more with Rogue One. You know, just kind of telling us who the cast was. I thought maybe they'd bring out the cast, but I understand that, that they're filming and everything. But I, I just got to say, this is the big, this is supposed to be Disney's alternative to Comic-Con right? This is supposed to be the big thing why Disney is starting to pull out of Comic-Con slowly. This is supposed to be their big thing. And there is no bigger property that Disney has right now than Star Wars. And they, they blew it. They totally blew it. It was um, a really anticlimactic climactic ending, especially since they made it the last thing of the day. You know, if they had covered Lucasfilm stuff first, then maybe it wouldn't feel so weird about it, but we saw that they were leaving it till last. Finish big. Nah. Now, the biggest thing to come out of the Star Wars stuff that they were talking about, D23, was um, Iger got on stage and talked about how their Disneyland is undertaking their biggest theme land expansion ever. They are building a, they're not calling it Star Wars land, but they're building a Star Wars land. That's going to be like 14 acres 
It's going to be completely inhabited by droids. Like they say, when you're walking the streets, you're going to feel like you're on an outer rim world in Star Wars. There's going to be droids. There's going to be strange aliens. Every bar you go into a restaurant, there's going to be like a cantina feel to it with a cantina band and all that kind of stuff. It sounds amazing. It sounds great. But they fell short, unless they announced something later that I didn't hear, they fell short of actually telling us a date. So I was talking to a Movie Talk fan afterwards in the hallway who approached me, and I said, it's hard for me to get excited about news of a Star Wars land when there was no date attached to it. Like, I don't know if it's two years away. I don't know if it's 15 years away. No idea. So that was a little disappointing. Overall, Star Wars thing, they they fired blanks. Disney blew it. They really, really did. They needed, if this is your big alternative to Comic-Con, you needed to show us or present us or give us something more than just, hi guys, we can't wait for this movie. Here's a picture of the cast. Bye! And, and that was it. Totally blew it. Okay, now, but they had several other things at D23 at that presentation that were actually quite good. They actually led off with Marvel. And so the big focus on Marvel was Captain America Civil War and Doctor Strange. And considering they haven't even started shooting Doctor Strange, they put together a terrific package for us to see. So what Kevin Feige did, Kevin Feige came out on stage and he he said, oh, look, we have no footage, but this is D23, so we got to show you something. Well, why didn't Lucasfilm do that anyway so Kevin Feige comes out this is D23 we got to show you something even though we haven't started shooting the film yet so what he did was he took all the concept art like the storyboard art that they've got for the movie and kind of put together a trailer with music of just the still images of the concept art and in that concept art it looked fantastic it looked great Benedict Cumberbatch in the Doctor Strange outfit looked awesome uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor looked awesome. And it looks like they're following that classic story, the one that we got in the Doctor Strange animated movie, right? Okay, so Stephen Strange, world-renowned, brilliant neurosurgeon, gets into a car accident, cripples both of his hands, exhausts himself trying to figure out a way to fix his hands. Eventually, he winds up going on a worldwide trek, a pilgrimage, if you will, to try to find answers and ends up stumbling across the Ancient One. Um, who, you know, basically helps him then transform into Doctor Strange. Um, it looks great. And I was so impressed that even though they hadn't started shooting, they had such a great package to show the fans. Once again, Lucasfilm, take note. Anyway, um, moving on from Doctor Strange, they showed us a bunch of uh, Captain America Civil War. They showed us, it's hard for me to remember. I'm going to guess three to four minutes. I think three to four minutes of footage they showed us in kind of a makeshift put together trailer. Um, and I was impressed by it. I was impressed. It didn't blow my socks off. I wasn't in tears, but I was impressed by what I saw. Remember, they're still putting this movie together. I was impressed by what I saw. I liked it a lot. But the last 30 seconds... So you feel like you've seen all the footage they're showing. And then all of a sudden, it's like they tagged on this extra little 30 seconds at the end with Paul Rudd as Ant-Man, but you don't see him in his Ant-Man outfit. And it's the first time Paul Rudd meets Captain America and his buddies, and he's just geeking out that he's meeting Captain America. To me, it stole the show. Those 30 seconds of Paul Rudd meeting Captain America completely stole the show for me. I thought it, it looked really great. It looked really fantastic. So that so kudos and Marvel did a great presentation and Anthony Mackie came out on stage. Chris Evans came out on stage. It was a really good presentation. Um, so that was Lucasfilm and that was Marvel, but there was also just Disney, the Disney productions with their own films they have coming out. And I got to tell you, the thing I am walking away from the most out of D23 wasn't the Marvel stuff, even though I love the Marvel stuff, wasn't the Lucasfilm stuff. I was really disappointed with the Lucasfilm stuff. And you would think those would have been the top two things. The thing I walked away most curious about and most impressed by, and now I'm looking forward to insanely, is the John Favreau Jungle Book movie. Folks, if you're like me, this John Favreau Jungle Book movie, you're kind of thinking, sounds a little bit throwaway, like a little bit of a potentially throwaway thing, whatever. It's going to be another Jungle Book incarnation. John Favreau comes out on stage with the president of Disney production, and they're talking about how, you know, this is going to be the most technologically advanced film ever made. And that's bold. That's a bold prediction to say. 
And you're thinking, really? And John Favreau comes out and talks about their process and what, how they went about making this movie. And then they showed us the sizzle reel for it. And they said, remember, everything you saw, everything you see in the sizzle reel was shot in Los Angeles. And it looks amazing. I cannot wait for this Jungle Book movie. Um, Bill Murray as the voice of Baloo, I have to admit it didn't fit for me. It didn't, but I'm sure it's going to be great. The lines were funny and, and he starts humming Bare Necessities. It was pretty cool. But they they brought out um, a bunch of footage showing how the, the landscapes will look and how the creatures will look. Uh, Lupita Nyong'o came out and she's doing the voice of the python. I think the python's name is Ra or something like that. Looked stupid. Stunning. It looked so good. Sir Ben Kingsley came out and he's the voice of the panther in it. And they bought, brought the little boy out who plays Mowgli. And I'm telling you, hearing them talk about it and then watching, it had to be about three or four minutes of uh, footage that they showed. It's kind of a makeshift long trailer. I, I got to tell you, I felt goosebumps watching it. it. It just looked incredible. I cannot wait for this. Johnny Depp. They went on and they talked about Pirates, the new Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales. Johnny Depp came out on stage in full Captain Jack garb. So he came out in character as Captain Jack, throwing grapes out into the audience. And that was a really cute thing to do. Hasn't increased my excitement for the new, for the new Pirates of the Caribbean movie at all. But that was a very cool thing for, for them to do. They spent some time talking about the new Chris Pine, Eric Bana film, um, uh, The Finest Hours, about, and it's based on the true story of that Coast Guard boat that had to go out in like the worst storm in history to try to rescue guys off this sinking tanker. Um, and it, it looks much better than I thought it would. So that was pretty cool. Pete's Dragon looks really cool the way they're approaching it. Um, they showed us a bunch of stuff from the new Alice in Wonderland film, the new Alice through the Looking Glass. Um, they brought um, um, Wazakowska. I always mispronounce her last name. Anyway, they brought her out on stage, and she looked totally uncomfortable on stage, like she's not used to standing in front of a crowd. So it, that was a little bit awkward. And then they showed us the footage, and I wasn't blown away by the footage at, at all. It did nothing to increase my enthusiasm for that movie. But I got to tell you, overall, though, Disney production did a great job with their presentation, especially when they, they just crushed it with that Jungle Book presentation, like just crushed it. So that was my experience, the D23. Um, you know, the Marvel stuff was really, really good. The Disney stuff was fantastic. The Lucas stuff really underwhelmed. So that's that. All right. Now, with all that out of the way, let's get to the first official question, even though hundreds of you are asking me about that. Now let's get on to the first official question for Mailbag, and we get started with this. Andrew Athanathios, and let me try that again, Athanathios, Athanathios, I hope I'm getting that right, Andrew. Uh, he writes, I have a question about what I think is a very com common argument amongst young movie fans today. Who is a better actor, Leonardo DiCaprio or Christian Bale? They're very close in age and evidently both A-list actors. They're both very selective about their roles and have worked on some films that will be around for decades to come. But let's say we only had one spot left on Mount Rushmore. Which one of them would deserve this spot right now? Some people argue that Bale is the better actor, but DiCaprio has been in better movies. Is that true? Which would earn the spot on Mount Rushmore? Well, thanks a lot for the question, uh, Andrew. And yeah, that this is um, DiCaprio or Bale, man. I mean, that is a question that comes up a lot. A lot of people want to ask. And it's, it's one of these questions that is ever, the answer to that question is ever evolving because they each as actors are ever evolving. And so it changes up. It is a very difficult question. Look, neither I would put neither one of these two guys in my top two right now. Like, I believe the top, the best two actors in the business right now are Daniel Day-Lewis and Russell Crowe. I believe those are the two best actors, um, pure actors. We're, we're not talking about how good their movies are. I'm just talking about how, they, how good they are as actors. I think they're the top two. But then in that conversation of top five, you've got to consider DiCaprio and Bale to be in there as well, in there. It's tough, man. These are both, look, if I'm a producer, I put either of these guys, first of all, I do jumping jacks with joy if I find out either of these two guys have agreed to be in a movie that I'm producing. That is just a no-brainer. These guys are phenomenal. 
Okay, so let's look at Christian Bale. Christian Bale, he's had some amazing films. He's had some great films that he maybe wasn't all that great in. Um, like, look, when we're looking at films like American Hustle or American Hustle, Christian Bale got an Academy Award nomination for. I did not think he deserved it. I thought he was very good in American Hustle, don't get me wrong. But I, and I think even a lot of hardcore Christian Bale fans were a little bit surprised when he got a nomination for Best Actor for that film because I don't I don't think that was his best work. Um, even though it was very good, it was great, no doubt about it, I didn't, I wouldn't have necessarily gave him an Oscar nod for that one myself. X's Gods and Kings, it is what it is. Um, Out of the Furnace... <sighs> Out of the Furnace was a movie that disappointed a little, had so much potential, and I didn't really feel like Christian Bale was bringing it in that one, but that being MMA. Uh, then you're looking at the Batman films, iconic The Fighter, in which he won an Academy Award for. Frankly, he shouldn't have won an Academy Award for The Fighter because they put him, they copped out and put him in a lesser category. They put him in the category Best Supporting Actor when clearly he was a lead actor in that but they didn't want to put him in the category of best actor. Why? Because they knew he had no chance against Colin Firth for the King's Speech, so they knew he had no chance of winning that, but they had, he had he definitely had a very good chance of winning best supporting actor, even though he wasn't a supporting actor in that film. Before people go on, no, it is totally misnomer. There is no rule that says only one lead actor can be nominated for a lead role in a particular movie. There are many, many, there are many examples in Oscar history where multiple actors got nominated for best lead actor or best lead actress. There's even a film where three actors got nominated for best lead actor in a film. So there is precedence for that. And so, yeah, he won the Academy Award for The Fighter, and it was an award-winning performance. He was awesome in that movie. But I put a little, I always put a little asterisk beside that because he shouldn't have been in that, uh, in that movie in the first place. Then he was bad. Let's just say he was bad in Terminator Salvation. He was awesome in 310 to Yuma. He was great in The Prestige. He was, I think, one of his more underrated films, Rescue Down, or Rescue Dawn, I'm sorry. Um, I think Rescue Dawn is, is an underrated film, and I don't think enough people talk about Christian Bale's performance in Rescue Dawn because it was really that good. Then you're looking at the one where he dropped down to like eight pounds in uh, The Machinist, and then the one that really brought him onto everybody's radar, American Psycho. Just incredible. Christian Bale's been nominated for two Academy Awards. He was nominated for Best Supporting Actor in The Fighter and won. Once again, I put a little asterisk beside that. And then he was nominated for Best Lead Actor in American Hustle. I didn't really think he should have been nominated for that, but whatever. He's just a phenomenal... When you look down that list of films, there is no denying he's one of the great actors today. Now, if we look at Leonardo DiCaprio, um, we are looking at a guy with four uh, Academy Award nominations, three Academy nominations for Best Lead Actor. Uh, he was nominated for Best Lead Actor in Wolf of Wall Street. He was uh, nominated for Best Lead Actor in Blood Diamond. He was so good in Blood Diamond. He was nominated for Best Lead Actor in The Aviator. And he was nominated for Best Supporting Actor once for What's Eating Gilbert Grape, which is still a movie that a lot of people go back and watch and go, holy crap, how was this guy this good this young? I mean, he was stupid good in that. But then, you know, you're looking at movies like Wolf of Wall Street. You're looking at movies like... Catch Me If You Can, Gangs in New York. Um, we talked about the aviator. Oh my gosh, his role as a villain in Django Unchained and it's like just across the board. So if you're going to ask me, and this is a purely subjective question, everybody's going to have a different answer for this, no doubt. But if you're going to ask me, if I had like a role in my film and I had to put, had to put, I had the awesome privilege of putting either Leonardo DiCaprio or Christian Bale in, and I can't put them both in my movie, and I've got this one thing for this one role, and I just absolutely need to know it's going to be brought. Personally, I'm going to DiCaprio. Um, just because I find, I think at their peak, when they're absolutely both at their total A game, they're, Christian Bale and Leonardo DiCaprio are practically neck and neck. I'm going to lean towards DiCaprio, though, because I believe DiCaprio is a bit more consistent. I believe when you look across his body of work, there's a consistency of excellence. Um, whereas when he's at his peak and when Bale's at his peak, pretty much neck and neck. But I find that when you look across their body of work, I think DiCaprio has been a bit more consistently high, 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 high quality. Um, and Christian Bale, while many of his performances are super high quality, every once in a while... 
He kind of mails it in a little bit. He's not a hit or miss actor. No, no, he's a hit actor. But once in a while, a little bit more than DiCaprio, I find, he'll have a performance that doesn't quite measure up to the standard of excellence that we've come to expect out of Christian Bale. So that's just my personal opinion. So for me, if I got to choose just between the two, I'm leaning towards DiCaprio. Great question. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section. All right, let's move on to the next question today. And the next question today comes to us from Mark McGallan, who writes, how do you feel about the news that Fantastic Four sequel is supposedly still moving ahead as planned? Although, uh, I, I, although I think Trank's movie was not good, I really like the first half, and I think there's a lot of different places you can go with this story. Plus, uh, whoever comes in to do the work on the sequel has a great cast to try and utilize better than the previous movie did. Lastly, Fox has in fact shown with X-Men how they can have a few stinkers, but ultimately find a way to work past them and make a solid movie. So what do you think? Is there hope for this franchise? Well, you know, we've been talking before, we've talked the last couple of weeks about Fantastic Four. And look, Fantastic Four is not an abomination train wreck of a movie. It's just incredibly disappointing. It's a bad film. It's a bad film. It's a bad film that had everything going for it. You know, I, I talked for a year about, you know, I started, you guys heard me say, I started off very skeptical because I didn't like that they were going to the Fantastic Four Babies, but I came on board with it. Great director, great writers, great cast. And I thought, you know what, and seeing what they did with X-Men lately, I had a lot of hope for this film. And then, then a few weeks before the movie opened, I changed my mind because it's like, oh my gosh, Fox is hiding the film from everybody. That means Fox doesn't like their own movie. They don't want critics to see it. They're scared to death. They know this movie is bad. And so once that happened, then I was like, oh, now I don't think this movie is going to be any good. Then we saw the movie and it's not a good movie. But I think a lot of people are overreacting to how bad it is. Look, if, if you want to be honest, the first half of the movie isn't terrible. There are some good qualities. It lacked depth. It lacked character development. It lacks a number of things, but it wasn't a train wreck. There were actually some pretty decent redeeming things about the first half of Fantastic Four. Um, and it's it's the first half is not a terrible movie. The second half, uh, the third act, terrible. But it's a bad movie. I'm not, but I don't think Fantastic Four, honestly, is going to end up in my like 10 worst films of the year. It'll be amongst my top three disappointments of the year, but you know, I, it, it's a bad film. It's not Catwoman bad. It's not Highlander 2 bad. It's not, you know, um, Battlefield Earth bad. It's not like that, but it's a, it's a bad film. It's just a bad movie. So the interesting thing that, that uh, the, the question brings up, though, is, look, Fox has done a bad X-Men, a couple bad X-Men films, you know, whether you're looking at X-Men Origins Wolverine or whether you're looking at, you know, X-Men 3, X-Men The Last Stand. They've done a couple bad films, but stuck with it and then turned out great films. X-Men First Class, X-Men Days of Future Past, and now we're all super excited for X-Men Apocalypse. So are they still going to move ahead with the sequel? They're say, nobody has said they've canceled plans for the sequel. They still have a release date for Fantastic Four 2 in 2017. I do not believe it's going to happen. Um, this is a three strikes and you're out situation. And here's why I think it could work for Fox with X-Men, but it cannot work for Fox with Fantastic Four. Here's why. We talked about those two stinkers in, in particular with X-Men, right? X-Men Origins Wolverine, X-Men 3, X-Men The Last Stand. X-Men 3, The Last Stand, while it was a bad film, that movie made... $460 million worldwide. It was a profitable movie. It made the money. $460 million worldwide. Now, that's not a gigantic blockbuster box office smash hit, but it's a big number, man. $460 is a big, big number. Made them a lot of money. X-Men Origin, now that doesn't talk to the quality of the film, but from a business point of view, it's like, hey, we we botched this, but it still made tons of money. So you can make another one. X-Men Origins uh, Wolverine made 300, north of $370 million worldwide. It was profitable. It made them money. So even though they turned out a couple of stinkers, 
the audience wanted to see it and it made them money. So there was motivation there for them. Well, let's take another crack at it because we haven't lost any money on this yet. We're still in the black. Let's, we think we can get better. We think we can improve. Let's make another one and see how that turns out. And so that was kind of their um, modus operandi, if you will, for that. They, they had, it was making money. So no big deal. They could keep moving forward and keep making these films. Fantastic Four, though. X-Men The Last Stand made $460 million worldwide. Wolverine, X-Men Origins Wolverine, made $370 million worldwide. Fantastic Four, right now, has made $75 million worldwide. $75 million worldwide. Now, it's going to make a little bit more money because it's still in theaters, but it's dropping like a stone in the lake. Maybe, maybe, if everything happens right, Fantastic Four can crack $100 million. This means, as opposed to X-Men Days of Future, or X-Men of Last Stand, or X-Men Origins Wolverine, which made Fox money, lots of money, Fantastic Four is going to cost them a fortune. They are losing so much cash. Some people are pegging it. They're going to lose $60 million on this movie. I think it's going to be closer to 70 or $80 million when it's all said and done that they lose close to $100 million. They're going to lose on the, that is firing money. That is money where executives get fired from studios when you lose that much cash. Now, that does not automatically mean Fox will not move forward and try it again if they really think they can make this happen. But now let's bring into consideration what we have talked about before, the track record. They've whiffed three times now at Fantastic Four. The first one sucked. The second one sucked. The third one sucked. I didn't think this new one was quite as bad as the last two. I actually, I think this one is better than the, the previous Fantastic Four films, but they're all bad. Three strikes, you're out. And you just lost tens and tens and tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars. If I am an executive at Fox and I think I'm going to make another Fantastic Four movie, then I'm going to have a board that's going to come to me and say, what the hell do you think you're doing? You just lost us 60, 70, 80 million dollars. And you want to do this again? You really think you're going to do that with our money? I mean, I just, I just don't see it happening. You cannot say it's impossible. You can't. Anything is possible in this business. But at this point, I just don't see a reality in which Fox moves forward with Fantastic Four. I just don't see it. Especially now, since the audience just went to go see this Fantastic Four with this cast and this new incarnation and did not like the movie, what makes you think they're going to come back again? It's a losing proposition. So while it is certainly not impossible, while it is certainly not impossible, Fox very well could move forward. I just can't see it happening. Not with how many times they failed with it, not with the financial numbers or the fact they just lost so much money on this film and their prospects of making money with the next film seem slim to none. I Personally, I can't see it happening, but let's see what happens. All right, let's move on to the next one. And the next question today comes to us from Kaishan Peck, who writes... Been watching for three years and is loving it. Well, thank you so much. My question is, what would you rather want? Star Wars The Force Awakens sucking and Batman vs. Superman rocking or the other way around? Personally, I can't decide. Thanks. Well, Mr. Peck, that's a horrible question to ask me. That's cruel. That is a cruel and unfair question, man. I... I mean, my my two most anticipated films in the world right now, Batman versus Superman with Ben Affleck, who's going to crush it as Batman. I've called that from day one. Me and Schnepp, only guys on the planet. The day they announced Ben Affleck, when everybody else was crying, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And everybody else is making these little meme jokes like, ha, 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 they got Ben Affleck. John Schnepp and I did a video the day they announced it. We said, this was brilliant. He is going to be an awesome Batman. You wait and see. And now 
Everybody's coming around. Suddenly now people are saying, no, I never made that meme mocking, you know, them casting Ben Affleck as Batman. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Shame. Anyway, um, but I think he's going to rock it as Batman. I think this movie is going to be incredible. I loved Man of Steel. I know not a lot of people did, but I did, and I'm unapologetic about it. I think that movie's brilliant. So I'm so excited for Batman vs. Superman. I've been waiting for this movie forever. However, Star Wars is my life. It is the blood in my veins. It is the essence of who I am. It's, that's, that's so pathetic, I know. But it's true. Uh, there are many pathetic things about me. Make no mistake about it. And that is one. Uh, the fact that I wrap so much of my love and passion up in some science fiction movie franchise but I do um so much of my emotional well-being is based on how good Star Wars is um it's I, so man it's like asking me hey you just had twin sons one's going to become president and one's going to become a drug addict which one do you want them to be uh, uh, I mean what do I do with that what do I do with that there is no correct answer all I can tell you is what my answer is, and it is neither right nor wrong. I want them both to be awesome, but if I had to pick one, Star Wars must succeed. Star Wars must be awesome. I don't have any kids right now, but when I do have children, I want them to be able to pass down my love and my passion for not just the old Star Wars movies, but the new ones. The prequels don't count. Um... One of my sons does love the prequels. Okay, make that one the drug addict. The other one becomes president. Anyway, um, so I, I want to be able to share my love for Star Wars with my children and pass that on down for generations to come. It's just a little bit more important to me. So there is no right answer to that question. There is no wrong answer to that question. There is only my answer to that question. There is only your answer to that question, whatever it is. And my answer to that question, as much as it pains me to say it, I would rather have, I, I, I will do anything. I will break some laws. If there's something I can do, folks in Lucasfilm, is there anything I can do, even if it involves breaking some laws that will help you make Star Wars Force Awakens really, really good, I will do it. Do you need a human finger? I might be willing to chop off a human finger for you if you have some magic cauldron that J.J. Abrams has that if he just had a human figure, finger that he could drop in the cauldron, it will magically make sure that the new Star Wars movies are awesome. Take my finger. Take that one or take this one or take this one, whatever. Um... I, I will do it. I will give it up because that is how important uh, these movies are to me, which is really sad. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes from Robert Johnson. And Robert Johnson writes, since Patrick Stewart has made a reference to Old Man Logan for the next Wolverine film, do you think Fox will use Dr. Doom for that movie? I know he wasn't a major character for the Old Man Logan comic, but he is one of the few villains in that storyline that Fox has got the rights to. Uh, thanks a lot for the question, Robert. And first of all, let's be very, very clear about this. Now, the quote that they're referencing here is that Patrick Stewart, we talked about it on Movie Talk the other day, talked about the fact that he is going to be in the new, the and apparently the final Wolverine film. And he's talking about how it's going to be nice because this time Wolverine's going to be older. Let's be clear here. Fox has not said that the new Wolverine film, Hugh Jackman has not said that the new Wolverine film, nobody involved with the Wolverine film has said that it's going to be Old Man Logan. Okay, let's be clear about that. Now, I think you and I can be forgiven if we take Patrick Stewart's comments as suggesting it's going to be an Old Man Logan. Absolutely. I mean, I think it kind of suggests it too, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Nobody has said it's going to be Old Man Logan. So let's just be clear about that. But now let's entertain the possibility that it is Old Man Logan. Some very interesting things they could do here, but we, as we've always talked about, it presents some real problems because there are key major figures in the traditional Old Man Logan storyline that you simply cannot use. Look, Hulk and his Hulk gang, all the Banner children, like they're major key characters. And there's a lot of them. There's a major key characters in that storyline. You can't use them. You know, can't use Hawkeye. Can't use, you can't use a lot of important figures that are in Old Man Logan in it because they, Fox simply does not have the rights to them. That does, though, offer the possibility of Doctor Doom, where you could use a Doctor Doom character to replace other characters. 
Like whether maybe the role of Hulk in um, in the old man Logan storyline, maybe that he, that becomes replaced by Doom. I mean, I don't know how they do it. I'm not saying it's a good idea. I'm not saying it's a bad idea, but it is a tool in Fox's tool chest that, hey, Dr. Doom is a character they have the rights to, so they could theoretically utilize him more if they so chose. I don't think they're going to do that, but it's certainly a possibility and it's certainly one we have to keep our eye on. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Edsel Laurel, who writes, Hey, crew, love the show. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is, which film has the chance to break the all-time record for opening weekend and in total box office? Star Wars The Force Awakens or Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice? Uh, thanks and keep up the great work. Um, interesting question. I, I still believe this. Um, Jurassic World just set the all-time opening weekend box office record, just beat Avengers. And the opening weekend box office was like 208 million something. I think it's like 208 million is the is the record now. That's that's more money than most movies can ever hope to make in their lifetimes, let alone on their opening weekend. If I had to say one of these two films, which of these two films, the new Star Wars, the new Batman vs. Superman, has the better chance to break that record? I've said this before. I will say it again. I still stand by it. Batman vs. Superman does. Why? Because I think Batman vs. Superman is better? No. Because Batman vs. Superman is opening in a better time of year for big opening weekend box office numbers. Star Wars is opening in December. Okay? No film in the history of film has ever opened in December to more than $86 million. And that was, I, I believe, The Hobbit. I think one of The Hobbit movies opened to $86 million. That's it. No film has ever cracked 100 million, let alone come close to 200 million. There is simply too much going on in the month of December. Christmas is coming. It's, you know, the deep of winter in a lot of places in the U.S. and in Canada. Um, it's just, it's a difficult proposition. I hope I'm wrong. I do believe Star Wars The Force Awakens will become the first film ever in history in the month of December to break $100 million on opening weekend. But breaking 200 is a tall order. Not to mention, Star Wars The Force Awakens is coming off of the prequels that turned a lot of people off of Star Wars. So it would be a different discussion if we we're talking about episode eight. After we've had an awesome Star Wars movie in Star Wars The Force Awakens, that would be it might be a little bit of a different conversation. But the biggest player here is the month of December. That's the big one. And I think it's just too much to ask any film. I don't think if Batman versus Superman opened in December, it would not crack 200 million, I don't think. So because Batman versus Superman is opening in a better time of year for opening weekend numbers, I believe Batman versus Superman has the better chance of breaking the Jurassic World record. Now, whether it will or not, I'm not I'm not sold on the idea that it will, but it certainly ha I think it has the better chance. Which one has the better chance now of catching the all-time box office record. The all-time box office record uh, is held by uh, Avatar with like $2.7 billion. $2.7 billion worldwide. That's the record. Which, between Star Wars and Batman and Superman, which one has a chance to break it? The answer is really neither of them. The answer is neither of them. Look, Avengers was a massive, 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 massive global hit, the likes of which we haven't seen in a long time. Jurassic World just beat it. But Jurassic World is under $1.6 billion worldwide. The one that just broke all the records is under $1.6 billion. That's still $1.1 billion away from what Avatar did. What Avatar did was lightning in a bottle. Like as far as box office and how it just ca ca had people coming back and more people come back and just all that kind of stuff. I honestly don't think that either Batman vs. Superman or, or Star Wars can catch it. I just don't. I believe it's it's it was lightning in a bottle. I don't think it can be done. But if we're asking the question, which one of the two has the best chance, I do think Star Wars The Force Awakens. I think it will have very long legs. I believe even though it will be hurt by its low opening weekend box office numbers in that it won't be $200 million, that it will continue to make tons of money hand over fist for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And, weeks. and uh, I believe it has a chance to catch Jurassic World, 
but catch Avatar? I, I don't see that happening. So, which of the two films has the best chance to break, has the better chance to break the opening weekend box office record? I say Batman versus Superman has the better chance. That Not that it necessarily will, but I think it has the better chance. Which of the two has the best chance of catching Avatar for the all-time box office record? Star Wars The Force Awakens does, even though I don't actually think it has a chance to do it at all. It has a better chance than Batman versus Superman. That's just my thoughts on that. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Raz Abrahaman. I hope I'm saying your name right, Raz. Hi, Collider crew. I've recently watched a movie called True Story with Jonah Hill and James Franco that came out earlier this year. It was not a masterpiece or anything, but it had great actors like Hill and Franco in it. So why did nobody care about it? Why do you think it did so poorly at the box office? And why didn't you or any other critics actively discuss the film? Thanks and keep up the great work. Well, the simple answer to your question, Raz, is that it is a bad movie. It, it was a bad movie. Um, True Story was a very disappointing film. It wasn't a piece of garbage. It wasn't total crap, but it was a poor movie. And what highlights it being poor, this is much like Fantastic Four. What really highlights how poor it was was the fact that it had such great potential. The source material was something you could have done something really rich with. Two great actors, both Academy-nominated actors. Um, in it, you're, the potential was just so good to be such a good movie, and neither critics nor audiences liked it, me included. Also, the studio wasn't in love with the movie either. Like the widest, usually most big wide release films now open around, you know, around the 2000 theater mark. Now, while... True Story did have a wide release, technically. It opened in over 800 theaters, but that's less than half of what a lot of major films does. I mean, it's enough theaters that, that, hey, if you wanted to see True Story, it was in a theater somewhere around you. With over 800 screens, it was in a theater somewhere around where you lived. You could have seen it if you wanted to. The movie made like $1.9 million on its opening weekend. See, this is the thing. Nobody cared about the movie. The studio didn't care about it. They didn't put on enough screens. They didn't do enough of a marketing push for it. And it wasn't a very good movie. Opened on 800 so screens. And the weekend that it opened, I believe it was like April 17th, it opened against, here are the two films it opened against. Paul Blart, Mall Cop 2, and that little unfriended horror movie shot with webcams. Those are the two movies it opened against. And it made $1.9 million on its opening weekend. And, you know, why did we not talk a lot about it or other critics talk a lot about it? Well, we did talk a lot about it in its, in its you know, production days when it was being produced and they were putting the film together and they made the announcements about what the movie was about and who was in it. We talked about it a number of times. But it was just such a blah movie that there wasn't anything there to talk about. And remember, you're asking like, hey, it's got big stars. Why didn't it do big? Because... Movies don't do big business based on stars anymore. The only thing that having good stars in your movie does now is give your movie credibility. That just means when the average moviegoer now looks at a film and they see a recognizable star in it, they'll take your movie seriously. But you still have to sell them on whether or not they want to see the movie, right? And that's pretty much what, you know, having James Franco and Jonah Hill starring in that film, it gave the movie credibility. That means, okay, okay, show us a trailer we'll, and we'll give it a shot. The trailers failed to impress. The movies, the movie wasn't that good. It didn't get decent reviews. And so it just kind of sputtered and failed. So it just goes, look, a lot of big name stars are in straight to video movies now because, you know, a big star no longer guarantees people run out and see a movie. It just doesn't. It'll get your foot in the door with the audience because it'll give your movie credibility that then the audience will go, okay, okay, I'll see what this movie's about. And then they'll, then they'll judge if they want to see it or not. A lot of times though, um, if there's nobody in a movie that an average moviegoer recognizes, they won't even look at it. They won't even like take it seriously. They won't really consider going to see it. That, that's not an across-the-board rule. There are totally exceptions to that, but I think that's generally the principle with average moviegoers today. You, however, put uh, a Harrison Ford in there or a Brad Pitt or a Leonardo DiCaprio or a Denzel Washington or something like that, and the people go, oh, he's in, okay, well, what's this movie about? Now you got their ear, but that's all it gets you. It just gets you their, their ear. This isn't the 80s anymore. We're all Schwarzenegger's in a movie. Okay, all I needed to know, take my money. You know, that's not the era we live in anymore. You got to put out a good-looking film that looks good, and then it's got to be good. And unfortunately, true story, in my opinion, personally, your opinion may be different, but I, my per, uh, opinion personally was that it failed to do that. 
All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question comes to us from Christian Ortiz, who writes, Hey, movie crew, love the show. I've been watching for some time now. Well, thank you so much, Christian. My question is for you, um, for the upcoming Ride Along sequel, will it be any good? I mean, I've been looking forward to it because the first one was so good, but I feel like, just based on the trailer, it's exactly like the original. Kevin Hart slapping Ice Cube, uh, seen it. Kevin Hart's exaggerated acting <clears throat> at a crime scene and getting caught because of him. Well, take a drink. Ah, and getting caught. <clears throat> oh. <clears throat> All right, let me try this again. <clears throat> Five, four, three, two, one. <clears throat> hey, movie crew, love the show. been watching for some time now. Well, thank you very much. My question for you is, do you think the upcoming Ride Along sequel will be any good? I mean, I've been looking forward to it because the first one was so good. But I feel like, just based on the trailers, it's exactly like the original. Kevin Hart slapping Ice Cube, seen it. Kevin Hart's exaggerated acting at a crime scene and getting caught because of him, seen it. And Kevin flying off when the fan smacked him is just like the shotgun scene. Do you think it still has potential to be different? Well, thanks a lot for the question, Christian. And you know, it's funny because the the um, Ride Along 2 trailer came out, but I remember it came out, I think, on Thursday. And Thursday, but it came out after we wrote the show notes and we didn't think just a new trailer dropping was enough to preempt something else. We thought, okay, we'll just cover the trailer tomorrow. And then Friday, we totally forgot about it. So uh, I'm glad you asked the question because it gives me a chance to address the uh, Ride Along 2 trailer. Um, that trailer's awful. It's awful. This trailer reeks of The Hangover 2. Just follow the exact same formula as the original. Uh, and you're right. It, it, it felt like every gag in it is a gag we saw in the first film already. This trailer looks really bad. And it doesn't even look like a fun homage to the 90s style cop films. It looks like a bad version of the 90s style cop films. This looks terrible. However, put a big asterisk beside that. I thought the trailers for the first Ride Along movie looked awful too. I, I, I did. I thought this movie's going to suck. The trailers were not good. And all film is subjective, but me personally... I liked the first ride along. I did. I, I was entertained by it. I had a good time with it. Was it a great movie? No, but it was entertaining and it was fun. And, and I didn't think it was going to be any of that based on the trailer. So now we see the trailer to the second one and it stinks. This, it, this is a terrible trailer, but maybe we'll get lucky and it'll be better than the trailer suggests because the first movie was better than the trailer suggested. I like the first movie. However, you are right. I do get a little worried that we're going to get a Hangover 2 situation here where it, it looks, all these gags are showing us is just total repeats, copy, paste, copy, paste from the first film. And that does make me a little bit nervous. So I still have hope for this movie, even though I didn't like the trailer, because I didn't like the trailer for the first movie, yet I enjoyed the first movie quite a bit, actually. But this, ugh, yeah, this smells of Hangover 2. So does it have a chance to be different? It still has a chance to be different. Will it be different? That'll be the question we'll have to get the answer to. All right, let's move on now to the final question of the day. And the final question today comes from James Bonifer, who writes, Hey guys, been watching since 2012 or 2013. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate you, that, James. Anyway, love the show and glad to see everyone found a new home at Collider. Anyway, it seems like the big buzzword in the movie industry this year has been studio interference, as it's been present in all the major superhero releases. Joss Whedon's negative comments about Marvel Disney and his limitations causing a burnout, the whole Edgar Wright controversy surrounding Ant-Man and Fantastic Four. It seems whenever you turn, there's someone crying about how terrible studio intervention is and how the director should always be allowed to have total control over his or her uh, vision. Are studios interfering too much? Well, thanks a lot for the, the uh, question, James. And 
We've been kind of addressing different versions of this question a bunch lately, especially when you're considering Fantastic Four and what just happened with Fantastic Four. There are There is no one definitive answer to the question, are studios interfering too much? There's no, because it, it differs from movie to movie. Should inter studios interfere um, in movie making? Yes. I know that's not the popular answer, but the answer is yes. The studio owns the movie. That movie is not the director's movie. The movie belongs to the studio. The movie belongs to the producers. It is their movie. It is their vision. All right? They went out and hired the director to come in. For, in most cases, there are, there are many, many different types of scenarios, many, many, many different types of situations. Yes, but I'm just talking generally speaking here. There are many exceptions to it, okay? But we're just talking about this type of situation where the studio has a vision for this, this movie they want. And then they go out and they hire a director that they think can bring their vision to the screen. And they want to hear the director's take and what the director's, the flavor that that director wants to add to it. And they meet and then they make a decision. Yes, we like what you said. We like how your vision meshes with ours. This is the movie we want. Now you go and make this movie. Here's what we want our movie to be though. We want it to be this, this, and this. Can you make that movie? And they go, yes, I will bring my flavor, my style, but I will give you a movie that has this, this, and this. I often compare it and I think it's a totally accurate analogy. Some people try to write me, John, that analogy doesn't apply. It absolutely applies. To to a homeowner, homeowner hiring a contractor, right? And you hire a contractor, you, you own a house. You say, okay, I want to do some renovations on my house. It's my house, my house. And I am paying for the res uh, uh, reservations. I am paying for the renovations. <laughs> so here's what I want. And you tell the contractor, I want my two-bedroom home to be turned into a three-bedroom home. And I want a wide open space, bright kitchen. That's what I want. Now, I'm not an architect. I'm not a construction guy. So I don't know how to make that come to life. You are, but here's my vision. What would you do knowing I want three bedrooms and I want a wide open concept kitchen with lots of light? How would you do it? And then the contractor and the designer sit down. They say, okay, well, this is what we would do. We would move this here. We move this here to accommodate having three bedrooms. And if we do this, this, and this, and do it this way, this will give you three bedrooms. And if we do th this in the kitchen and move this here, and this will give you your kitchen that you really want. And then the homeowner, myself in this situation, the homeowner goes, okay, yeah, yeah, I like that. Go ahead, do your thing. Make sure you're giving me the house that I want because it's my house. But yes, we're in agreement now in advance. You go ahead and make that house for me. Now, at that point, it becomes there's a very fine line that with interference. At this point, now that I've given the directives to the construction person what I want, and they told me how they would bring it to life, and I agreed to it, now I should generally stay out of their way. Until, you know, if the 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 construction guy goes, you know what? I have I have this idea. I've got this vision now where I want to make this a four bedroom house. So I'm going to do this instead. Then I'm going to come and say, no, 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 no. I don't care if you want four bedrooms in this house. It's my house and I want three bedrooms. That's what I want. That's what we agreed to. Give me my three bedrooms. Oh, don't interfere with me. I'm the artist. I'm the construction guy. This, this, I'm the designer. Don't interfere. Don't interfere. What do you mean don't interfere? You want me to cut you this check or not? Give me the house that I want. I mean, and in that case, that's the situation between studios and directors. It's the studio's film. It's the director's, it's the producer's film. It's their movie with their vision. What happens though sometimes in a situation like Fantastic Four, and this is why I get like, why I take the opposite side of this argument in a situation like Fantastic Four is that sometimes though, you know how I just gave you an example where the, the designer just decide on their own, oh, I'm going to make it four bedrooms. Well, sometimes the studio changes the rules. You know, Fox came in in the situation of Fantastic Four and they just started to rip everything that they had agreed on. With, you know, they sat down with Trank. Trank gave his vision. The studio told him their vision and they said, yes, this is the movie we're going to make. And then all of a sudden, Fox sweeps in and they start changing. They start pulling major action scenes out. They start editing the film behind his back. They start doing... It was just... That's interference. That's interference. A situation like the first Avengers movie where Joss Whedon comes, I got a vision, I want the Wasp in it, I'm not going to have Black Widow, I'm going to do blah, 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 blah. And the studio says beforehand, says, no, no, we don't want Wasp in this movie and we do want Black Widow. So even though you came up with a script with Wasp in it and no Black Widow, do it again, 
take her out and put Black Widow in. Go. That's totally, that is the good kind of interference. That's just the studio making sure that before the cameras start to roll, that the director and they as a studio are on the same page with what it was they want. Remember, much like it's my house, this is the studio's movie. They got to get the movie that they want, working with a director who can bring it to life. And that's what it's all about. But then you get certain situations like Fantastic Four where, you know, it they just couldn't stay out of it. They had agreed on a movie. They had agreed on what this movie should be in the direction we're going to go and then just step in like just moments before the camera starts to roll and start changing everything. That's different. This isn't the same kind of situation of like with Sam Raimi and Sony. Um, Sony, every, it's very famous now. Sony insisted they wanted um, uh, Venom in their Spider-Man 3 movie with Tobey Maguire. And everybody talks about how that's the studio interfering. No, that's the studio telling the contractor, telling the designer, telling the director, hey, our movie, this is what we want in our movie. Now you make a great movie with this character Venom. Go. That's not interference. That's not interference. It's not interference unless they were already shooting the movie for three months and then all of a sudden Sony comes down, hey, we just read an online poll that people really like this Venom guy. Can you put Venom in this movie now? See, that would be the Fox kind of interference. This, that wasn't interference. That was simply the studio telling the director, this is our movie and this is what we want in our movie. Now, your job as a director is to take that vision we're giving you and come up with a vision of your own to creatively and effectively empower in a powerful way, make a movie with that character in it. Go. And um, and and that's why I always dismiss people say who say, oh, you know, Spider-Man 3 sucking was Sony's fault. They interfered. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. I love Sam Raimi. He's awesome. But every director, even Steven Spielberg, has a bad day at the office. And Sam Raimi botched Spider-Man 3. It was not Sony's fault. It was not Sony, Sony interfering. It was doing what every other movie does. The studio telling the director, this is what we want in our movie in advance. Before the camera started rolling, this is what we want in our movie. And then Sam Raimi said, okay, we'll, we'll do it. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't have done it that way, but fine, we'll do it. And Sam Raimi made a Spider-Man movie with Venom and made a bad one. Whatever. But this situation with Fox and Fantastic Four is totally different. I mean, that was crossing the line. And so... There is no one definitive answer. Do studios interfere too much? Studios should absolutely be allowed to interfere in movies that belong to them. But at some point, even as a homeowner, if I hire the contractor and we agree in advance what we're, we're going to build, I got to stay out of the contractor's hair then. As long as they're sticking to the plan, then I should stay out of their hair. I shouldn't go in and start nitpicking. Oh, instead of shade blue, deep blue number four, now I want... Deep shade blue number three. I, I mean, just stay out of the, their hair at that point. As long as the director is sticking to the plan, let them let them give your movie to you the way they want to bring it about. As long as they're giving you the movie that meets the requirements that you let out for them, then stay out of their way. What happens beforehand is not interference. What happens beforehand is the homeowner telling the construction guy what they want. And that's totally acceptable. Anyway, guys, that'll do it for me for this installment of Mailbag. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget one more time. If you've got a question or topic you want brought up on our show, just send it to us at collidervideo at gmail.com. We'll do our best to get it on either Saturday and Sunday's Mailbags or get it in Movie Talk sometime Monday through Friday. And hey, listen, guys. Make sure you bookmark Collider.com. Visit Collider.com every single day. Steve Frosty Weintraub, he runs Collider.com. Him and his crack team of writers are always doing an amazing job keeping you up to date by the minute on everything breaking in the world of entertainment. you got to be reading their stuff. Make sure you bookmark Collider.com. If you want an audio-only version of this podcast for a limited time, make sure you go on iTunes or your favorite Android podcast app and just search for Collider. You'll find our podcast there and you can listen to audio-only versions if you so choose. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click on subscribe. It's the best way imaginable to keep up to date on all the videos we're doing over here. 
at Collider Video. And hey guys, make sure you follow me on Facebook or on Twitter. I often make a lot of announcements and everything. I was tweeting live from D23 yesterday and I'm making a lot of announcements regarding Collider Video before we announce them on the show or anything. Make sure you're following me at John Campia. And hey guys, don't forget, we have an Instagram account too. Wendy around here is always taking pictures, putting them up on our Instagram. Make sure you follow us on Instagram or on Twitter, just at Collider Video. So that'll do it for me, guys. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And until next time, bye-bye.